Greetings students and happy chapter number 20 in human development. So now we're going to start our journey talking about what we think of as middle adulthood. So the ages of 25 to 65. And I said to you before, we break adulthood into three different segments. The first one being emerging adulthood, 18 to 25. We talked about that last time. This is the middle adulthood section, 25 to 65, and then we will talk about later adulthood, okay? So during this kind of 25 to 65 age range, we're gonna see senescence. Remember we said the word senescence means the aging process. And we're gonna see that start to pick up as far as the amount of it and severity of it. And we're gonna see that as we get up there in years, that our body is going to decline in many different ways, right? Whether that's fig um, whether it's kind of physically in our physical environment, also our cognitive, we're gonna see lots of different changes going on here. And again, during this middle adulthood, we will cover four decades, or you know, a decade is a 10-year period. So we will cover four different 10-year periods, 25 to 35, 35 to 45, 45, 55, and 55 to 65. So a lot going on during this time frame everything starts to slow down. Yeah, so what that means is, is that if my kind of body systems are not functioning as optimally as I would like, it means that some of my organs are gonna to have to do a lot more work, such as your heart. And so we see your high blood pressure increases with age, right, hypertension. And that is because your, blood, your, your heart is having to pump over time to get your blood to go to the same places it used to go before rather easily and so it's doing that extra work this is why things like exercise become so important because we need to make sure that our organs are in good shape to do that extra work that's required as we age um so lots of different things you know are going on with our brain or, or our mental function the big one that we see change that we have to adapt to is that there is a reduction in our reaction time. So your reaction time lengthens. What does that mean? That means, have you ever maybe talked to somebody who's 55 or 60 and you've asked them a question and they kind of pause before they answer? Or they think about it a little longer than you would normally think about it as a younger person. That's what we mean, your reaction time lengthens. So if you have a 65 year old driver driving down the roads, you're gonna find that if they have a hazardous situation, such as somebody runs a red light and they're already in the intersection there, it takes them a little longer to slam on those brakes and react to the situation than it did when we were 20, right? And that's what we mean. Your reaction to situations and your thinking is a little longer. It requires a little bit more patience on our part, right? We do know that Alzheimer's disease, your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease increase with age. And we say that there is about a one in 1,000 chance that you have the gene for Alzheimer's disease. And again, it's similar to breast cancer or other cancers where if you have a family member that has had this disease or condition, it's something that you may inherit that gene from. All right, outward appearance. So lots of changes going on physically, as I said. A big one or a big area we're gonna see some changes in or that kind of maybe depicts age is your skin. So think about it. We all make judgments based on physical appearance. We do, we are human, we are critical. And when we see someone, we're assessing their age. That's one of the first things we do. And a big way that we assess or determine their age is by their skin. Wrinkles equals older. Right? Smooth skin might think of as younger. And what we know is as we age, our collagen is going to gradually decrease. So what is your collagen? Your collagen is this, what we think of as elasticity in your skin. So when you were 16, when you were 18, your skin was like, you know, it was just like smooth and had a lot of elasticity and firmness in there. As we age, that decreases. We again get some wrinkles. We will lose that ability of plumpness or firmness, maybe that we think of in those younger years. So again, by age by 30, you know, we're looking at some wrinkles becoming visible by age 40. Now we're starting to get what we call sunspots or age spots. 
this is why one of my um, primary pieces of advice that I would give to people who say, I, I want to I age well. It's going to be make sunscreen your best friend. I don't leave my home without sunscreen on my face. And I don't use the kind that we're talking about when you go to the beach and it's thick and creamy or you spray it on. No, there is sunscreen for your face. And when we talk about sunscreen, you're talking about high numbers. You're talking about SPF 70. 100. These are big numbers, but now this is what we know we need. SPF 15 does nothing for you. It's just not because our sun is just a huge, it is kind of like the enemy of healthy aging. It is. It's the enemy. It is going to give you premature wrinkles. That's what it will do. So we start to get age spots. And for us Americans, we tend to get them on our left hand side more than our right hand side because we are left side drivers in America. Right, so we're, we drive uh, on the left side of our car, therefore the sun is forever coming through your glass window, which is what the rays of the sun do, right? UVB rays and UVA rays are different, right? UVB, think of as like sunburn. UVA rays, think of as this kind of sunlight or rays that can come through glass. So if you work in an office and you work next to a window, those sun rays are still coming through there. Um, so that sun ray is going to damage your skin. As you get older, you start to see these little spots, right? And that is from sun damage. Again, not just is it physically maybe unappealing or something you really wouldn't want if you just protected your skin from the sun, but it's also those are the precursor to melanoma or skin cancer. And that's why I don't want, I want you to be careful about making sure to use sunscreen. My kids who are, you know, young have learned to put sunscreen on. And so I, I every day before they go to school, they walk out that house, they should have sunscreen on because I've taught them that that is really, really important. All right, um, by 60, we are getting quite a few wrinkles here. So our skin is kind of the first telltale of our age and we judge people on that. As you can see here in the picture, we live in a society that is anti-aging. In other words, we live in a youth-centered society in the West where we value youth. We do not really value our elderly and we don't really respect the aging process as other cultures and countries might, such as Japan. And so we do lots of things to look younger or to prevent that aging process. And here's one of them, Botox. So Botox is a neurotoxin. It is what we call a filler. It is something that what happens here as we inject this serum and a lot of women get it in their uh, forehead because of the lines that we develop on our forehead as we age. And what you're doing is you're, you're injecting a, you know, it's kind of like a, a liquid, if you will. And what it does is it paralyzes the nerves in that area. And so when you go to laugh or smile, what happens is you get those lines, but people who have had Botox, they don't have those lines because you've, you've caused the nerve to not react to your facial expressions, which it does look nicer. However, I think it's kind of interesting because you might be able to spot people that have had Botox because when you make them laugh, it's kind of like from here down, their face is laughing and smiling and then here nothing moves and it's kind of weird, <laughs> right? It's kind of funny. I have um, a wonderful friend who is a nurse in dermatology and she works for a dermatologist and he has a private practice and she shares with me all the time that business is booming. This is a good field to go into because people, and I shouldn't say just women, many men and women are seeking out different services, light therapy, all kinds of different things, zapping varicose veins, all kinds of medical things that we are doing to basically look younger, right? To not look your age. That is the big thing. Now, I will say that, you know, Botox doesn't have just um, kind of these cosmetic uses, one of my foster daughters, she's 17, um, who lived with me, she had come from a, again, abusive, traumatic home. And in her home, both her father and mother uh, beat her. They punched her. And her father punched her in the face, and in particular on this right side cheek, so many times that he actually killed the nerve that are in this cheek. And so the, ner the, the nerves or this muscle died. 
And so she actually had to have surgery because what happened is as your muscle is dead inside of your skin here, it will calcify, become hardened, and it becomes very painful when it's hard. And so they actually had to go in and cut out part of that muscle because it was so painful. But what she does is she actually goes, I take her to the doctor every six months or so, and she gets Botox injections. And so the doctor will inject the Botox into this muscle here on her cheek, and it will paralyze the nerves so that she doesn't feel the pain. And we know it's time for her to go back to see the doctor when she starts having the pain, when she goes to eat, move her jaw and things like that, and it's painful. So in those regards, Botox can be very useful for some medical applications to help individuals, right? But this is a really booming field of kind of not aging or, or keeping yourself looking youthful. My girlfriend, she's a good friend, she's actually said to me, you know, I noticed some lines up there. I can give you a really good discount on some Botox and kind of funny, she's good enough of a friend, I'm not offended at all, but I tell her I'm okay, you know, lines are part of the aging process and I'm okay with that. Many other people may not be, um, but understand this is kind of something you, there are some things you can do to ward off aging, which is again, sunscreen, sunscreen, and then apply more sunscreen. All right, lots of other things going on as we age, right? Um, our hair starts to change, not just in color that we get gray, but also the kind of the, the shape and texture and um, width of your hair changes. It may become more coarse. You may lose it, right? Not just for men. I'm not just talking about the receding hairline for men. A big thing now is that women are really experiencing different, not just receding hairlines, but a lot of maybe balding or losing um, hair in different parts of your scalp. Right? But a middle age spread, I like to think of it as the tire around the middle. Right? So it appears as we get to be 50, and what this is, is kind of a change in body shape that happens. And I kind of say people go to this place of having you know, a tire around their waistline. This is not good. A couple of reasons why. So number one, what's happening here is you're collecting this adipose tissue, which is just fat. So you're collecting fat and you're collecting it in the wrong area. Because when we say that if you were to add fat to your body, we tell you it's much better to be a pear than an apple. Meaning I would much rather have you carry the extra fat in your hips, your butt area, then and your thighs than I would in your middle area. So it's much better to be shaped like a pear is shaped than an apple where the fat is around the waistline because any extra weight around your waistline is actually putting extra pressure on your heart, which is making it work a lot harder, right? And they say for every extra inch of fat you have, it's, it's a year off of your life. That, like in other words, if you were genetically going to live to be 85, so you're taking years off of your life, by having that extra fat on there. Not to mention your propensity for diabetes type two, all kinds of different issues. And so the middle age spread, we're gonna have to work to prevent it. Our metabolism slows down as we age, and that means exercise becomes more crucial. So what also happens as we age? Well, we tend to shrink a little bit. Yeah, this is why your grandma seems to have gotten smaller because um, the, our osteoporosis, or basically our, our spine, is you know as we're young that spine is hard and firm and it's able to hold us upright and to carry all of our weight as we age your bones go from being hard to being more like swiss cheese in other words they become they get holes in it they get porous easy to break and it starts to curve our spine starts to curve as we get older and then we shrink a little bit okay, so most of us are going to lose some height when it comes to aging Lots of our senses change, right? Think of, you know, some of the people that you know that are a little older. Um, your vision is dramatically going to change. Your hearing is dramatically going to change as we get older. Sexual responsiveness. I know it's really difficult to think that older people have sex. They have sex and they have a whole lot of it, right? Um, research actually shows us that men, uh, men and women are most likely to be extremely satisfied with their sex life when they are in a committed monogamous relationship. In other words, more than being single and having sex with different people, having a committed relationship with that person as we age, hopefully, 
we are having open conversation about what pleases us, about what we want. And that leads to this healthy communication, which leads to healthier sex life, right? And so um, it may take a little longer for arousal and orgasm to occur as we age, um, but we will see that people are still very active, right? Kind of just talk about this a little bit. All right, infertility, meaning couples that cannot conceive naturally, about 12% of our couples are infertile, meaning that there's something going on that we are not able to have a baby. And um, we talked earlier in the earlier chapters about why that is, right? Whether it is we're waiting longer to have kids, different environmental issues. This is a really interesting statistic. Two thirds of our sexually active women over the age of 35 are sterilized. What we mean by sterilized, we mean they've done something to prevent them from having children. Not just taking the birth control pill, but they have had a hysterectomy. They've had their uterus removed. They have had um, their tubes tied. Right? They've done something surgical. Now, with you know, be careful with all of these, you know, a hysterectomy, you are never going to conceive again. The issue with the hysterectomy is there's a lot of hormonal changes that go on when we move those parts of a body. Um, with our tubes being tied, I've had two girlfriends who have gotten pregnant with their tubes tied. And that is, again, because if we tie your tubes, understand after about seven years or so, your tubes can actually come untied, which can then allow you to become pregnant. So we're doing some alternative methods nowadays to sterilize women. In my opinion, 35 is kind of young. Yeah, 35 is pretty young to say, I don't want any more children. Right? But that is what research shows. All right, and the birth rate among women who are 40 and over is increasing. Right? Because we said, women are waiting until they have a successful career or they're financially established or they find that mate later in life that they want to have a family with or be a single parent and that's taking a little longer. Right, menopause. So what is menopause? Menopause happens to women. It is basically when your body will, kind of the opposite of puberty, your body will cease to produce several different hormones. In um, particular, we're gonna talk about estrogen. And so it is when your menstrual cycle stop completely. That's menopause. Now perimenopause is the time leading up to menopause. So for instance, if you go three months without a period, that's considered perimenopause. When you've gone one year with no menstrual cycle, you are now considered to be menopausal. Lots of changes come with this. Just like we saw in puberty where hormones were dumped into a young person's body, all of a sudden we're removing a lot of hormones from a body and women go through a lot of changes, whether that is hot flashes, night sweats, and it can last for years, years and years. Some women have a pretty easy time of it, others have a more difficult time, and some women really face what we call these psychological consequences. In other words, some women feel like if I just started having children in my 40s and already at maybe 49, I have menopause, maybe I wasn't ready to not be able to have more kids. And there's an emotional component to that. Right? Andropause is what we call male menopause. Extremely different from menopause for women. Basically what happens in andropause for men is we see a reduction in testosterone, in the amount of testosterone levels. However, understand men can still sire and have children up until their later years. 90s, men can still have children. Women cannot. Once you hit menopause, you will no longer conceive. Right, so it's a reduction, but no, it does not at all mean that um, we, you cannot have children after you hit this andropause. And this is you know, one of the reasons we might see a lot of ED issues or erectile dysfunction, which is something again, that happens maybe for some men in later years. Um, and we have lots of medication that we use for that. Causes of weight gain. So as we age, why do we gain more weight? Um, we're gonna see it. The big one I mentioned before is our metabolism slows down. So what is metabolism? It is the way that, if you took nutrition, you would know this, right? Because I teach nutrition and we talk about how it's the way that your body kind of takes the food you eat and converts it into energy 
all kinds of chemical reactions happen that cause there to be energy, which makes your lungs go up and down and it makes your heart beat and it makes you be able to run and walk and do everything that we do. So when we're younger and if we're physically active, our metabolism is very high because we turn over food quickly. We eat food, we, we expend the energy and then we need more food, right? As we get older, that process slows down, which means we need fewer calories. It means we shouldn't be eating the same amount when we were younger as when we're older. Because if we do that, the weight is gonna pop on. We're gonna keep on. So again, slowing down how much you eat and then increasing strength training or anaerobic activity, weightlifting, this is really important as we age. As we say here, exercise helps everyone at every age and every condition. You see this gentleman is at work here and he's on a treadmill. So he's actually doing computer work while he is walking. This is awesome. As you see me talking to you here in all of my videos, I'm actually standing. I do not like to sit, but I know it's not good for you. Sitting is not good for you. So I stand, I have a high raised computer desk. So I do all my rest, all my work kind of at this stage and I have a treadmill and I do my you know three miles in an hour several days a week, um, just getting my walking in. But we need to do all different kinds of things because as we age, it's gonna get harder to do the same type of, for your body to do the same functions it used to do when you were younger. Okay. And sitting isn't just, you know, they basically say for every hour you sit down, you should stand up for one minute. Every hour you sit down, you stand for one minute. You see this lady here is using a stability ball. That's what it's called. It's this big ball, and it's kind of cool because if you have a job where you answer the phones all day, you sit at a desk all day long, what you can do is replace your chair for a stability ball. And what you would do is sit on that stability ball, and what happens is when you sit on this ball, because of the shape of the ball, the ball wants to roll out from under you in all different directions. And so what you do is you will engage what we call your core muscles, your center. You will engage those core muscles to make the ball stay still or to not let it roll. And so it's like you can be on the computer and you can be talking, but your body is like in motion. Your body is kind of doing some work and that's a good thing anytime that your body is doing that work. Okay. And I want to make sure to let you know, let's not have this, these misconceptions that, oh, wow, you know, uh, I'm just not going to be able to be flexible or change anything. This is one of my favorite yoga instructors. Her name is Jasmine. And you can look on YouTube and find her videos, but she blows me out of the water. She is incredibly flexible does amazing workout routines. And I wanna make sure to show people that, you know, no matter what your body shape is, what your body size is, you can, if you commit to this, starting off very small and gradual, commit to gaining more strength and more flexibility, you can do that. What do we recommend right now? We're recommending 150 minutes per week. That's a lot, right? That, that's a lot. That means five days at 30 minutes a day or however you want to break that up. And then it changes as we age. So for myself, I noticed some really big body changes once I hit 50. It was much harder to keep the weight off when I hit 50. And so I had to actually go to a personal trainer and say, okay, so my metabolism is changing, my body's changing, what do I do at my age? And it changed everything I did. When I was younger, I used to really like to do aerobic activity. Kickboxing was my thing. I love kickboxing, and that was my exercise routine. Now I don't really do that. I do a lot more what we call strength training, which is actually putting weight onto your muscles to build up those muscles because as we age, we lose lean muscle mass. We gain more body fat and lose muscle. And so we need to be doing that. So I do the treadmill, I do some stairs, and I do a little, some strength training three times a week. And I eat a little differently than I used to uh, in my younger years. And so we need to do those things to help our body adapt to this aging process. All right, so what we're gonna find here is most cancer deaths are, when we say attributable, it means that they're um, caused by lifestyle behaviors, such as smoking and diet. These are things we have control over. We're not talking about genetics. Genetics we don't have control over. 
whether you have a gene, whether your parents have a history of cancer, all of that, we can't control. But what you can control is your lifestyle. So do I choose to smoke? Do I choose to um, eat good nutrition? To eat, because we've talked all, all of our time together, we've talked about how a lot of these age groups are definitely missing the vegetables, even more, even some fruits. We're not eating whole grains, fiber, like we should be. And so we will say that your diet, those are choices you make. In addition, I would add exercise. Do you choose to exercise? And you know, it's not that fun. Sometimes I have to really mentally gear myself up and say, okay, I don't really feel like it, I'm tired, I wanna sit here, but I gotta get up and do what I need to do because it is so important physically and when I'm finished, I feel good. I feel really good, right? When you sweat and you break a sweat and you're just, you're done with your workout, you, you, endorphins are in your system, happy hormones, and you feel really, really good. All right, so again, as we get older, we're gonna say that our metabolism decreases and our digestion is not as good as it used to be. So we have to eat, chew our food well, eat a little slower. So mortality and morbidity, what are they? So the word mortality means death, whereas the word morbidity means disease. And what we know is that as the mortality or death rate the amount of people that are dying decreases, which is what it's been doing. It decreases. Our morbidity, or the number or percent of people with disease, increases. And this is because we have so many medical interventions that can keep you alive and that can sustain you. We have dialysis that if your kidneys don't work, we can get you on dialysis and they can do the work for you. And you know, lots of different things. Um, so what that might mean is that even though we're living longer, we may not always be living better because we may be living with chronic disease longer. All right, and so when we talk about some of our goals here, if you think about your, the healthcare industry, many of you want to go into healthcare. If you think about the healthcare industry, number one, it is just atrociously expensive. I challenge you to have no insurance and go in for one overnight stay in a hospital. And what your bill will be like is astronomical. So why do we have this? Why do we have just costs and expenses that are out the door for healthcare? A big one is because what we're doing is we're typically tackling the problem after it's happened. So a patient comes in and has a stroke and we deal with all of the ramifications or all the consequences of the stroke. They have to go to physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. We're doing all of these different things. Whereas what we want to do is look more at public health and look at what we call HMOs or health maintenance organizations. An HMO, Kaiser is an HMO. And so what Kaiser says is, you know what we need to do? We need to offer all of our patients classes on how to eat healthy, how to exercise so that we don't have a strip. So their idea is let's prevent the illness before the illness comes and happens because our money is being spent on dealing with the problems after they've occurred. Whereas we'd like to do is teach you, teach all of us to be good people or good stewards of our body, eat well, exercise, be emotionally healthy, all of those things. And then we won't have a lot of the expenses that we have in the US for health. All right. And again, we definitely see here that we've talked before about how money and education affect health in every nation. So how do they do that? Well, I mean, money is money, right? Money can buy medication, money can buy education, educate people. Um, and so, you know, these two things, when we have a career that has a job that has a good medical insurance, now I have access to good doctors. I don't maybe have Medi-Cal. Now I learn in college or I learn from my doctors what I should be doing with exercise. I learn all of these healthy habits where I didn't know those before. And so money and education really do protect or give you good health as we age. All right, what's a disability? The definition of a disability, as we see here, is a long-term difficulty performing kind of what we call normal activities of daily living in regard to something physical, emotional, or mental. Okay. And actually, many people that live with disabilities don't actually feel like they're in poor health. 
We see lots of, gosh, if you ever watched the Special Olympics or the Paralympics, oh my gosh, they're amazing. You see these individuals that do not have the use of their legs, but they are so physically fit on top. And they have their bodies in good physical shape, even though they don't have the use of their legs. And so they don't really believe they're in poor health. Um, they're dealing with a challenge. All right, so make sure to go through our clicker slides here, and then I will see you for chapter number 21 when we talk about what is going on in the mind as we go through this middle adulthood process.